Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rao's IAS. Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of The Hindu Newspaper dated 6th of October 2021. The articles which we are going to cover today have been displayed on your screen and let us now begin the discussion. With AUKUS, India must keep its head above water, appears on page number 6. So the announcement by USA of a trilateral enhanced security partnership involving Australia and United Kingdom has taken everyone by surprise. And not just the competitors, but also allies. With close partners on both sides, India has maintained an ambiguous stand on the issue. And a lot of commentaries have been made on this issue as to how this is a welcome step for India to access technologies, build complementarities and so on. But more often than not, the commentaries have focused themselves on comparison of AUKUS and Quad. What are the key differences between AUKUS and Quad? How the conceptualization of AUKUS is going to impact the functioning of Quad? How it can embolden Quad? And finally, how AUKUS is going to impact India and its interests in Indo-Pacific region. Now if you are wondering why we need to prepare this topic, you have to look into the syllabus of GS paper 2 under which international relation issues are covered. There is a line in the syllabus which says effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interests and Indian diaspora. So you can clearly understand because of a decision taken by United States forming an association with Australia and UK, effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries is directly linked with this topic. And so what we are going to do is that we are going to focus our discussion on the topics which I have already highlighted. The key differences between AUKUS and QUAD, how AUKUS seems to be benefiting QUAD and what is going to be an overall benefit for India if the stated goal of AUKUS turns into reality. Let us now begin the discussion. So a lot of people get confused between AUKUS and QUAD. Both of them are designed for the same region. Both of them have common membership of Australia and United States. So what purpose is AUKUS going to solve separately from QUAD? And so the important differences. So first and foremost is the nature of the alliance. AUKUS is a military alliance. It does not have any other purpose. It's openly and straightforwardly a military alliance, whereas Quad is more of a diplomatic alliance and not a military alliance. Since AUKUS is a military alliance, it has been specifically conceptualized to deal with security and military situation in the Indo-Pacific region. Whereas Quad, on the other hand, focuses on the affairs of the whole world or the global affairs, of course, with focus on Indo-Pacific region. Then AUKUS as a pact is openly to protect the Indo-Pacific from China's dominance and shield the post-1945 global order, which has been traditionally dominated by the Western powers and specifically US. Whereas Quad has an agenda of its own that suits the shared interest of all the members of the Quad. And so you can see that both the groups have common interest in protecting the Indo-Pacific region from China's dominance over other nations. But there are clear-cut distinguishing features between Quad and AUKUS. When we talk about differences between AUKUS and Quad, most of the criticisms of AUKUS have been with respect to its impact on Quad. Most of the people argue that AUKUS is indeed going to weaken Quad because of course Quad does not have clearly outlined agenda and activities, it is not a formal organization and does not have any formal structure and so it might end up becoming a mere deliberative forum. Because although Quad members have their own security or military considerations in mind vis-a-vis -vis China, after all, almost all the nations in Asian Indo-Pacific have their own security and military considerations in mind vis-a-vis -vis China, but they have been reluctant to make it an agenda in the summits, and so it has a higher probability of just limiting itself as a deliberative forum devoid of any kind of real powers. 
But this new development AUKUS has a great potential to aid and assist Quad in ways which right now we cannot think of. And this reinforcement of Quad because of AUKUS comes from three straightaway points. Formulating an AUKUS-like structure reassures US allies of its commitment in the Indo-Pacific region. And it's just not any other commitment. It's a very strong commitment from US and UK because it is first of its kind defense initiative of the US in the Indo-Pacific region. At the same time, AUKUS is also a shot in the arm of larger Indo-Pacific agenda of which India, US, Japan, Australia, among others are key partners. It augments the aim of the Quad ultimately of keeping Indo-Pacific region free, open and inclusive. If you look at it, ultimately this is the agenda of Quad also, although Quad does not explicitly mention this. But the members of Quad ultimately are opposed to China's incursions into South China Sea, into Indo-Pacific and its increasing hegemony in the region. At the same time, it intends to fill the vacuum which has been created by reluctance of Quad to be seen as an anti-China military alliance. Since Quad does not want to be openly seen as anti-China alliance, AUKUS has boldly stepped and has filled that vacuum. And finally, the AUKUS might make Quad more palatable to the ASEAN members because the AUKUS could take some of the pressure of the Quad by attracting the Chinese anger. And hence it might make Quad relatively more palatable to the ASEAN in comparison. Right now ASEAN countries do not have any other option except for Quad as an anti-China front. When they have two options, one is openly military and another one is a non-military diplomatic alliance, ASEAN members could easily hop on to it claiming that it is not anti-China. But then our UPSC syllabus expects us to be aware about the policies of developed countries on interests of India. And so our discussion would be incomplete without covering this angle, which is AUKUS impact on India. And what it seems to us right now, AUKUS is ultimately as a net result is going to help India. It's going to help India because it is first of its kind military engagement in the Indo-Pacific region to counter growing Chinese influence. India has been long waiting for such an initiative. And so AUKUS can be extremely useful in responding to any military provocation by China. Then it clarifies the role of big powers in the Indo-Pacific, for example, US and UK. The countries which have so far been very ambivalent or not very explicit in their involvement, especially military involvement in this region, now they have made it explicit. Apart from that, it augments the capability of Australia, which happens to be India's strategic partner. And last but not the least, it reduces the pressure on India and Japan to undertake commitments or activities on the defense and security front in the Indo-Pacific region. So these are the benefits which AUKUS is going to yield for India. But it is not to say that it's not going to have any kind of negative implications on India. Tussle between AUKUS countries and the France discourages consensus on larger issues of rise of China. And France's discontent feeds China's narrative about US's unreliability. France is a very, very good partner for India. And frustration of France is not good for India's interest in the long term. We can say that AUKUS augments Quad's objective, increases India's quest for a free and open Indo-Pacific in line with its principle of strategic autonomy. So in this discussion, we understood what AUKUS is and what Quad is, how they are different, how the development of AUKUS reinforces the idea of Quad and how beneficial AUKUS is going to be for India. Let us now move on to the next discussion. Health Benefits Package Under Ayushman Bharat Revised So the National Health Authority or NHA, the apex body for implementing Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Aroki Yojana has revised the Health Benefit Package Master under the scheme. In the revised version of the Health Benefit Package 2.2, rates of some packages have been increased by 20% to almost 400% under the scheme. This would enable the impaneled hospitals to provide better services to the beneficiaries under the Ayushman Bharat scheme. So as all of us know that Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Aroge Yojana is a national public health insurance fund of the government of India 
that aims to provide free access to health insurance coverage for low income earners in the country roughly the bottom 50% of the country qualifies for this scheme people using the program access their own primary care services either through a family doctor or through a private clinic when anyone needs additional care then the scheme provides free secondary health care for those needing specialist treatment and tertiary health care for those requiring hospitalization the program is a part of indian government's national health policy it is a centrally sponsored scheme and is jointly funded by both union as well as states now if you have to understand the importance of this topic from the perspective of gs paper 2 Welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by center and state and the performance of these schemes is a part of your syllabus. Issues relating to development and management of social sector and health is prominently written over there along with education. So you can understand that analysis of the scheme with respect to its significance, performance and concerns is actually a part of your syllabus. And just not that. UPSC has also in the main stage under GS paper 2 has asked a lot of question with respect to schemes. For example, in 2013, the concept of midday meal scheme is almost a century old in India with early beginnings in Madras presidency in pre-independent India. The scheme has again been given impetus in most states in the last two decades. Critically examine its twin objectives, latest mandates and success. In 2017, UPSC asked to ensure effective implementation of the policies addressing water, sanitation and hygiene needs, the identification of beneficiary segments is to be synchronized with the anticipated outcomes. Examine the statement in the context of the WASH scheme. So we understand that flagship schemes like midday meal schemes, Swachh Bharat are extremely important. And so in the forthcoming discussion, we are going to analyze the scheme starting with its highlighting features, its significance its performance in past 2-3 years and what the concern, what concerns have been raised in this time. Let us now begin the discussion. So what are the benefits under this scheme? First and foremost, government provides health cover of 5 lakh rupees per family. The families which are living below the poverty line across India. It holds children, especially the girl, child, women and senior citizens in special regard as it prioritizes them. And unlike most private sector insurance scheme, it covers pre-existing diseases. The scheme covers the treatment for pre-existing diseases in all impaneled hospitals across the country. The scheme provides access to quality healthcare by paperless and cashless means. Every impaneled hospital has a dedicated Arugya Mitra to help patients throughout the process. A beneficiary can avail of the required treatment in any impaneled public or private hospital across India. And finally, all eligible families listed in the SECC database are covered. There is no cap on family size or age of the members. So after discussing the features, let us now move on to the significance of a scheme like Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana. So a scheme like Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana leads to the reduction and a massive reduction of out-of-pocket expenditure. For example, in 2018, Indians spent around 62.7% of their total health spendings as an out-of-pocket expenditure. So on an average, if an Indian spends around 100 on health, 63 rupees comes from his or her pocket, whereas the government share is limited to just 37%. And this might not be a problem in case of a middle or upper middle class person, but this becomes a great problem when we are talking about below poverty line people. And that is why it is said that one instance of a severe disease plunges them back into poverty, even if they are barely above poverty line. Now in case of hospitalization, the expenses up to 5 lakh is going to be borne by the government and that is going to be a big big relief on out of pocket expenses. And since the scheme has made the health treatment, the tertiary health care treatment affordable, it has increased the access to health care, especially for the poor people. At the same time, it has led to the strengthening of public health infrastructure through infusion of insurance revenues. Because earlier, the government hospital did not have any significant revenue stream. Then, the scheme has incentivized creation of new health infrastructure in rural, remote as well as in underserved areas. Because now, the entrepreneurs and the doctors have incentives to open up healthcare facilities even in remote areas 
because there also the people are going to have the benefits of Jan Arogya Yojana and the government is going to cover their treatment as well. And so now you have an incentive for expansion of health infrastructure across the country. So how has been the performance of this particular scheme? And if we want to analyze the performance as to how it has changed the healthcare infrastructure or healthcare landscape across the country, 3-4 years is not significant enough time to judge its impact. But there are three areas where the impact is clearly visible. It has led to the consolidation of health insurance schemes, it has expanded beneficiary base and it has introduced strong monitoring mechanism starting with the consolidation of health insurance schemes with a significantly larger risk cover than what was offered as a part of earlier Rashtri Swastha Bhima Yojana. A consolidation at level of health insurance schemes is already happening across Indian states. For example, Karnataka has merged seven existing health insurance schemes into one, while Kerala has combined three different health care schemes into one. So it has led to the consolidation of various schemes. Then as far as expansion of beneficiary base is concerned, we have significant data to show that 11 states and union territories have expanded the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana or its state level variant to the point of universal or almost universal coverage. Also since its inception, the scheme has a very robust information technology infrastructure overseeing transactions and locating suspicious surges across the country. To give you an example, a lot of hospitals have been blacklisted in past two years, as well as fraud was detected at 341 hospitals in 16 Indian states during the first year of Ayushman Bharat scheme's implementation. But having said all of this, does not mean that the scheme is devoid of any concerns or issues or challenges in its implementation. And the concerns regarding the scheme can be mainly divided into six causes starting with the widening inequity or the widening of inequality because the analysis of the available disaggregated data in the public domain indicates that barring a few states like Chhattisgarh in the case of Jan Arogya Yojana, most top performers are the richer states. And this is a big problem because if India has to perform well, all the states will have to perform well and not just the richer states. Then the next set of problem comes from the low government control over the private healthcare system. Because the Clinical Establishment Act 2010, with the mandate to register and regulate health facilities, have failed miserably in regulating the private sector in 10 states and union territories where it was implemented. And it's just not about this particular act. The absence of standard treatment guidelines and protocol and irrational practices can increase the cost of care and overall budget for the scheme. And if you have not understood this point clearly, give me a moment to explain this. This particular scheme is like an insurance scheme. A beneficiary of this particular scheme is eligible for tertiary care in private hospitals as well. And private hospitals will get reimbursed for the treatment they provide. Now suppose if a beneficiary appears in front of an hospital with a stomach ache. Now currently in India, there is no standard operating procedure as to how to proceed from a stomach ache. There is no guideline which says that hospital cannot do his brain MRI. And since the payment is not coming from the patient, patient is least bothered about what charges has she been charged. And so the particular structure of this scheme gives a lot of incentive to hospitals to carry out a lot of tests, to carry out a lot of procedures for which they can bill the expenses, which will be then chargeable on government of India. Other countries which run similar schemes have very elaborate standard operating procedure. They give out treatment and the procedures for each and every symptom as well as disease. This actually reduces the incentive available to the hospitals to behave randomly because then they are accountable. The government can directly ask them about what treatment have they given and what was written in the SOP. But the problem with this particular scheme is just not limited to widening inequity and low control over private health care. It also extends to low budgetary allocation as well. Because the amount allocated to Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana in two subsequent annual budgets is also proportionately much lower to cover the targeted 40% of the population of the country. 
then we have an issue of quality control as well. It was observed that low volumes of certified hospitals are currently impaneled under this particular scheme. Out of 18,000 impaneled hospitals, only 600 were quality credited or certified. Then we have to understand that one of the important pillars or most important assumptions of this scheme is the existence of a very sound and robust private healthcare infrastructure. But it turns out that this particular pillar is absent or missing in our country. Registry of Hospitals in Network of Insurance or Rohini data suggests that only 3% of private hospitals are eligible for the Ayushman Bharat scheme. On an average, there are only 1.28 impaneled hospitals per 1 lakh population that can provide health care to patients under the scheme. Further, impaneled hospitals lack the infrastructure required to treat the patients. So these are the prominent challenges which can be put under separate headings. But there are other multiple or miscellaneous challenges as well. For example, the challenges which other schemes also face and that is of ghost beneficiary. Then we have instances of large scale conversion of outpatient treatment to inpatient treatment. So OPD is a place in hospitals where doctor first interacts with the patient. If she feels the need, then that person or the patient is admitted in inpatient or ICU or general wards. Now under the scheme, the benefits will be given only if the patient is hospitalized. And so it gives a lot of incentive for hospitals to convert the OPD patients into IPD patients. And so these are the challenges which this scheme is currently facing. And so as a way forward, the government should come up with standard operating procedures. The procedures which are going to elaborately define the treatment as well as the procedures to be followed in cases of all the commonly available diseases. Then we need to make our certification and accreditation process very very robust. Robust to such an extent that only those hospitals which have the kind of facilities they claim and only those hospitals where the procedures are followed rigorously should be allowed to be impaneled under the scheme. The government should also increase the allocation under the scheme especially under post-COVID scenario. So these are some of the way forward which you can write in your answer once asked about this particular scheme. With a bank appears on page number 6 as a column. The southwest monsoon has officially ended in India with around 87.4 cm of rainfall between June and September or just 0.7% short of the historical average of 88 cm. In many ways, this was an exceptional year. By August 10th, India was staring at an all India monsoon rainfall deficit of around 9%. But since September rainfall, 35% more than the monthly normal was so much that it completely closed the deficit and was well beyond the IMD's expectations. And so an obvious question which is asked and the concern raised year on year about IMD is its failure to correctly predict monsoon among plethora of other failed predictions which the IMD does. It becomes very important from the perspective of GS1 under environment as well as geography. Now the failure of IMD to clearly predict the Indian monsoon is just not because of inefficiency of the IMD. It has some other factors as well. For that, you have to understand and clearly delineate the concept of Indian monsoon, which has been clearly given in your NCRT textbooks. And so we are not going to delve into the basics of Indian monsoon. But on the basis of analysis, whether you apply classical concepts of Indian monsoon or emerging modern concepts of monsoon's origin and mechanism, we can clearly understand that monsoon is quite a complex and dynamic phenomena. Indian monsoon climate is affected by factors such as latitudinal position, altitudinal variations, the mountain wall of the north which is Himalayas, distribution of land and sea distance from the sea, the position and the velocity of jet stream both westerlies and easterlies, Tibetan plateau, tropical cyclones, western disturbances, El Nino and southern oscillation. And so you can clearly understand that monsoon is very very complex interhemispherical and interoceanic phenomena which makes the predictions very difficult on top of that the topography of indian subcontinent comprising of loftiest of the mountains expansive deserts longest and deepest valleys surrounded by oceans from three sides 
makes the monsoon highly variable in not just the space but as well as in time. And because of this, prediction of monsoon becomes quite a complicated task. Plus, India has largely a tropical weather. And in general, tropical weather are more complicated and more variable than the temperate weather and hence they are difficult to predict. So these are the three reasons because of which it is inherently difficult to predict the monsoon correctly. But there are other factors for which IMD can be held responsible. First and foremost, when IMD started predicting and adopting the climatic models, computer models to predict the monsoon, it clearly adopted the western models. The western models which were made to predict the weather and the climate of UK, France, Germany and US where there are hardly any reversal of wind. And so these models are inherently weak at predicting a climate like monsoonal climate. And so these models are not fine tuned as per the Indian needs. Then IMD does not have the kind of requisite infrastructure which is needed to clearly predict a complex phenomena like monsoon. For example, the automatic weather stations are of substandard quality. They need to be calibrated and cleaned regularly, which does not happen often. That affects the quality of the data. After all, dynamical models require huge amount of computations for which supercomputers are required. And IMD recently acquired supercomputers before which they did not have the state-of-the-art facility to predict the monsoons. This lack of infrastructure leads to data insufficiency. For example, IMD collects weather data like temperature, humidity, wind, precipitation through 679 automatic weather stations, 550 surface observations, 43 weather balloons, 24 radars and 3 satellites. However, this data is not enough given the size of India. And more data is required to make predictions accurate. Apart from that, there are major data gaps like those involving dust, aerosols, soil moisture and maritime conditions. So these are the factors because of which IMD is responsible. And then there are evolving conditions of pollution and climate change, which is making the overall weather and climatic modeling very, very difficult. For example, the increased concentration of aerosols in atmosphere tends to change the shape and characteristic of rain bearing clouds leading to extreme rainfall events but weakened monsoonal rainfall which then becomes difficult to predict. Similarly, climate change is not just directly impacting the monsoons but it is impacting other factors which impact the monsoon for example El Nino Southern Oscillation or Indian Ocean Dipole. And so these changes in recent times are making the Indian monsoon increasingly complex to be predicted. So from the perspective of mains examination, an analysis about the failed predictions of IMD can be asked. And these are the factors because of which it is inherently difficult to predict monsoon. And on top of that, there are deficiencies of IMD because of which the predictions of IMD fail to match up to the reality by a big mark. Let us now move on to the next news. Services PMI flags first hiring since November. The services sector last month recorded the second fastest expansion since February 2020, accompanied by the first hiring in 10 months, according to the IHS market survey based purchasing managers index. And just like all other indices in economy, for example, consumer price index, wholesale price index, index of industrial production, this PMI is also very, very important. As you can see on the screen, there have been a lot of questions dealing with indices. And it's only a matter of time when a question on PMI is asked. And so starting with who releases the PMI. And so PMI data is published by Japanese firm Nikkei, but compiled and constructed by market economics. And so this is a very crucial point. Generally, in all other indices, the agency which is responsible for compilation and construction is the same. But in this case, there are two different agencies, Nikkei and market economics. And so what is the source of information or what are the sources of information on which PMI relies upon? And so PMI is calculated based on information received from companies on various factors that represent demand conditions. It is very different from IIP which is indicative of actual production. The PMI takes in responses from a company on a monthly basis 
on whether there has been improvement, deterioration or no change for a set of parameters relative to previous month. And so what are the parameters which is used by PMI in calculation of the index? It is new orders, output or production, employment, suppliers delivery and stock of purchases. This questionnaire is administered to 500 private sector companies and the comprehensive score is arrived at. The PMI is constructed separately for manufacturing and services sector, but manufacturing sector holds more importance. And so what is a good PMI and what is a bad PMI? Or when does PMI indicates expansion and when does it indicates contraction? And so a figure of 50 is very, very important because above 50 denotes expansion in business activity and anything below 50 denotes contraction. Higher the difference from this midpoint, greater is the expansion or contraction. The rate of expansion can be judged by comparing the PMI with that of previous month data. If the figure is higher than the previous months, then the economy is expanding at a faster rate. If it is lower than the previous month, then it is growing at a lower rate. And so when you have to understand the importance of PMI, it is usually released at the start of the month much before most of the official data on industrial output, manufacturing, GDP growth become available. And hence, it is considered as a good leading indicator of economic activity. At the same time, a lot of people get confused between PMI and Index of Industrial Production or IIP. And so, it is important for us to cover the crucial differences between the two. First and foremost, PMI is released by a private agency, Nikkei. Whereas IIP, all of us know, is released by NSO. PMI does not track original or actual production, but IIP does track. PMI covers only 500 private sector companies, whereas IIP covers both private sector as well as PSUs. PMI covers both manufacturing and services, whereas IIP covers only manufacturing sector. And so PMI is obviously less comprehensive since it covers only private sector companies and obviously IIP is much more comprehensive. PMI is not used for GDP calculation whereas IIP is used for GDP calculation. Climate experts, theorists get physics Nobel. Appears on page number one. So three people in total, Sukoro Manabe, Klaus Hazelman and Giorgio Parisi have got the Nobel Prize in physics. They have got the Nobel Prize for their different works. So basically, the work is shared between two people for doing one work and one person, Giorgio Parisi, doing the another work. And so, they are going to share the prize money in one-fourth, one-fourth, totaling to half and half to Giorgio Parisi. And so, from the perspective of prelims examination under science and technology section, it becomes important for us to look into their work and try and understand up to the limit we can understand their contribution towards humanity and science. Starting with the Giorgio Parisi. He has been awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems from atomic to planetary scale. Because he built a deep physical and mathematical model that made it possible to understand complex systems in fields as different as mathematics, biology, neuroscience and machine learning. So if we have to understand his work in a very layman term, we will have to assume a box full of a lot of balls. And every time these balls are squeezed together, a new irregular pattern is formed despite them being squeezed in exactly the same way. So what governs this squeezing? Dr. Giorgio Parisi has discovered a hidden structure in such a complex disorder systems, which these balls represent and found a way of describing them mathematically. Then the two other co-workers, Sukoro Manabe and Klaus Hazelman have contributed to the physical modeling of Earth's climate, quantifying variability and reliably predicting the global warming. Their work lays the foundation of our knowledge of the Earth's climate and how humanity influences it. How increases in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would increase the global temperatures, hence laying the foundations for current climate models. Nobel laureate was the first researcher to explore the interconnection between the radiation balance and the vertical transport of air masses due to convection, also taking account of the heat contributed by the water cycle. 
We know that infrared heat radiation from the ground is partially absorbed in the atmosphere, hence warming the air as well as the ground while some radiates back into the space. Hot air is lighter than the cold air, so it rises through convection. It also carries water vapor, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. The warmer the air, the higher the concentration of water vapor. Further up, where the atmosphere is colder, cloud drops form, releasing the latent heat stored in the water vapor. We know that increased level of carbon dioxide leads to higher temperatures in the lower atmosphere, while the upper atmosphere gets colder. The Nobel laureate Manabe has confirmed that the variation in temperature is due to increased level of carbon dioxide because if it was caused by increased solar radiation, the entire atmosphere should have warmed up. And you can clearly see that from his model and experiments. Three different charts in blue, black and red color demonstrate the varying amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Blue color denotes 150 ppm of carbon dioxide black denotes 300 ppm and red denotes 600 ppm of carbon dioxide and you can see the red which has the highest concentration of carbon dioxide results in highest temperature in the subsurface level whereas low temperature in stratosphere so the temperature at the surface fell by around 2.28 degrees celsius when the level of carbon dioxide halved it increased by 2.3 degrees celsius when the level of carbon dioxide doubled so from the perspective of prelims examination, these are very crucial set of information which can be directly asked.